uh, for a toy and maybe not so toy problem. The, uh, I think the part that people might have struggled with uh, was covariance, is that right? People sort of nod to tell me yes, no. Not, if it wasn't yes. a problem, we don't have to talk about it at all. <laughs> uh, that, was the first, uh, that was the first big hurdle. Um, so, Covariance. Covariance is saying how far away are we from the mean? Um, because when when we have uh, a normal distribution, and I just tell you what the mean is, I'm not telling you anything about the shape. I'm just saying, on average, this is where things land. Uh, it could be that all the data points are they're very far away, or it could be that they're all stacked up on top of each other at the, at the mean. So this is if we have one dimension, then we can ask this other question, what is the variance, uh, to see what is the, the spread. And so we do that by, by taking all of our data, and uh, with sort of white spaces on my slide, that maybe it's just Like so if our if our data vector right, looks like this, it's x1, x2, etc., right, then we can also say, all right, the mean of our x vector turned into some. We could replicate this, right? So if you going to do this quickly in MATLAB, I did a rep map, right? So we, we ended up having the same number, whatever it was, let's say 0 0.73, 0 0.73. And if you, if you want, you can always take the difference between these two. So you have this difference vector that's telling you for each data point saying, how far away is it from that mean? And that's a, that's a very important scalar in one dimension because it's telling us, uh, well, X2 was way, way out there. Um, and so when you're calculating your Gaussian uh, shape, you, you will have to stretch it out further. When you have multiple dimensions, it's the same concept, except that now we're saying um, that the first dimension may actually have some impact on the other dimension. So when we organize our data and we say um, that our covariance, let's see, so we had our covariance minus mean of x vector, and we were saying this is going to be multiplied by same thing again, but this time transpose. So this is going to take all of our dimensions of x. Let's say that x is now this sort of uh, collection of RGB values, R1, <coughs> G1, B1, <coughs> R2, T2, B2. And the result of this uh, once we divide it by the number, and I think we've been using i, i, the number of data points, the result of this is going to be this 3 by 3 matrix, which is telling us the relationship between the r's, the g's, and the b's. So if, if someone hands you this matrix, and you want to be able to say something about it by, by looking at it, Then, what is the element? So I'm going to do it this way. There are nine elements in this matrix. If this number is big, what is that telling us? That the R values are very spread out. 
Right? So I, I, I'm keeping the same order, right? This is a covariance matrix, and you can think of it, it's telling us the relationship between R, G, and B versus R, G, and B. So this is telling us, this element here is telling us what's the relationship between R and R. If we were in one dimension, and this number was high, we would just say, oh yeah, the variance is, is high. So this is what we're dealing with here. It's a nice case. It's just saying, if you looked at all the R channel data, for all the data points, they vary quite a lot, i.e. they're far away from their mean. So the, same, the answer is the same for the green channel and the blue channel. So we've got this, this diagonal section, which is in a way quite dull. It says how much do the R's vary, how much do the blues vary, how much do the greens vary. All right. What about this element here? Makes a statement about the linear relationship between G and R. That's right. I mean, if G varies a lot, if it's high, then if R, R behaves linearly similar to G. That's that's right. So if R is um, there is a relationship between R and G, and the the greater the R, the more change we should see in G in a linear fashion. And we can compare the numbers there to say, for instance, is uh, if R changes, is green going to change more or is blue going to change more? In a way, this matrix is summarizing the relationship between these elements. If you have a zero here, that means there's no relationship. The covariance is we're saying it doesn't what R does doesn't seem to have an impact on on G. And you can imagine creating such data, right? I, if you sat there you could you could say, well let's see, to make that sort of thing happen, maybe I'll create a whole bunch of data with R being high. I'll, I'll pick a, a number from 0 to 255. I'll say I'll pick I'll make lots of data points with R equals 255, and then I'll make uh, green be everything between 0 and 255, right? So now we have these training examples um, where R is all over the place even though, sorry, where G is all over the place even though R uh, is always fixed. So this way we're, we're telling our system, don't, don't look, try, you can try to find a linear relationship, you're not going to find one. That's, that's really the, that's the extent of the intuition I'm trying to convey. That there's, <laughs> There's a matrix that describes how the different input data channels react with each other. How much do they vary? So when you see someone calculating covariance, imagine that they're just doing a linear algebra, so a matrix version of variance. Uh, they're trying to tell us something about the distribution of, of the data points in some slightly higher dimension. So we had, we've seen this slide and we, we're all sort of comfortable with this, right? Here we, we don't have to worry so much about covariance, we're just worried about variance. The point here was to emphasize this notion of the hidden variables H and the fact that we're trying to, uh, we're trying to, in this case, the M step, we're going to try to maximize the parameters of our Gaussians. So we're going from the dotted version to the solid version because we've said, you know what, this green curve, you, you're going to be responsible for all these points, uh, these blue ones. So it, it shifts from being slightly kind of in the middle to being more towards the right and peak here. Similarly over here, it shifts from the dotted version to the solid version because those points are expressing the preference in the in their distributions of H, saying I'd actually like to be associated with H equals one. Uh, so can can you take responsibility for me? When we all get together, we'll reevaluate our mean, we'll reevaluate our variance, and and our little club will be more coherent. It'll be a, a tighter uh, relationship of self-similar points. 
So things that we, we covered in, our, in great haste at the end of yesterday. Um, do we expect to always get these Gaussians given the same data sets? If I run mixtures of Gaussians multiple times? No. No. So what does it depend on somewhere else? Initial solution. Your initial solution. Your initialization, you, you drop it down and uh, you, you let it go. So maybe you ran it yesterday, maybe you got that far, or maybe you didn't. What would happen if I initialized I mean, I'm going to initialize with two Gaussians in this case. I'm going to use the data points that we have here, the blue, uh, these blue data points. Um, what would happen if I initialize one of the Gaussians to be very small variance, uh, centered close to one of the, close to this point, kind of on its, slightly on its own. And the other Gaussian I initialize to be sort of big and broad, kind of, uh, kind of on the right side here. I saw his hand so, first. So, so one problem I discovered with my code was that the one Gaussian, Gaussian was just taking responsibility for one data point. Yes. And the other Gaussian was taking was taking the responsibility for all others. Yeah. And then of the single Gaussian that just takes one data point, the variance gets zero, and that's not good. That's right. So this is, this is, you saw this uh, sort of in front of your, your very eyes, and if you're just evaluating the, the likelihood, the maximum likelihood at the end of, of any of these EM iterations, you would, just looking at the number, you would say, well, hallelujah, right? I have this infinite likelihood, I have this fantastic likelihood, because the coherence of the first club, this Gaussian that's centered around this point, is fantastic. Everybody in this club agrees on their mean and their variance is zero, right? They, this Gaussian is, is super peaky. Uh, and we all know that that's not quite, it's not desirable, right? We, we've basically created a, our hidden variables and uh, let one of them specialize too much to the point where it's not actually able to generalize. So it, it, it would be, you could think of this as overfitting, right? And there's a way to cope with it, or a way around it. We have to go back to the initialization step, indeed. Uh, and there, we might say, OK, I have a prior on my Gaussians. I have a prior that says, uh, I expect the covariance of my Gaussians to be very, very big. Okay, So you can converge to something later, if you like, but I'm going to start you off initially with some covariance that's massive, such that it includes you know, a whole lot of points wherever the mean is. So you pick a random mean, you know, you point somewhere, but it's a very big, it's a very big Gaussian, so the, this covariance matrix uh, has very large values. And that way, step to step to step, it will shrink, but it's unlikely that it will accidentally shrink just and, and hug one point. Instead, it will sort of collapse onto a cluster of points. So we said that the other, yes, sorry. We are, we are talking about Gaussians right now, and they have variance, and you still use covariance as an expression of that. What does covariance mean in this term? Then? Why, why is that? I mean, do you explain something that I understand that part, but how can you put that into the Gaussians? So when we have uh, an update step, Oops, there it is. An update step for our covariance matrix. Um, this is after the initialization, after we've done a step of, of expectation. So we, we had done an expectation, we figured out, uh, so who's taking how much responsibility for each of the points? Which Gaussian is taking how much responsibility for each of the data points? Okay, that's fixed now. Now we're going to allow ourselves to change theta, i.e. these parameters, uh, lambda, the mean, and the covariance. So to compute the new covariance, we have this update equation. But all we're doing in our e step, m step, e step, m step, is computing the maximum likelihood, i.e. we're ignoring the prior. 
but we can apply the prior early on and say, you know, this is going to be, this, this starts out being a three by three matrix. Yes, it will continue to be a three by three matrix according to these updates. And those updates will refine the shape of this, right? If, if there is a cluster of, um, of points where the green and the blue channels are all the same, so a bunch of pixels that all have the same green and blue value, but their red value is, is very high, it's all over the place, then that would correspond to a covariance matrix with, as we said, a big, a big number here. So let's say this, this update step that we're seeing there, it's going to proceed as normal, and we don't want to interfere with that. But we could initially kick it off by saying, let's make a covariance matrix, which has large numbers on the diagonal here and maybe zeros elsewhere. Or we could even initialize it kind of randomly, but we want all the numbers to be to be big, corresponding to, to if you plot the, uh, the first standard deviation, they would look like a big ellipse around a 2D set of data points. Does that help? A little bit. A little bit, OK. Um, but we can just plot. OK, so I, I, might, I might press on, but I I'm glad you're expressing doubt, and so maybe I have to think about a different way of explaining it. So if it if it still bothers you, it's probably still bothering other people who are just qu sitting quietly hoping that we you know we don't call on them. Um, okay, so let, let, let's let's press on. I don't have a better sort of a, a nicer way of explaining it uh, at the moment. Um, but I'll keep thinking. Okay, so uh, we said we said that we have this opportunity and initialization to to specify that we want large sigmas, right? Our large covariances, and that's what you're seeing in A. Basically, both of them are kind of eligible to take over all the points. Uh, and the other thing we can do is we can we can reseed them and try and try them at different sort of starting locations. Uh, and one of the things that people will probably notice is the similarity between this and the k-means algorithm. k-means algorithm, very nice, uh, fairly deterministic. k-means is essentially a special case of this. Uh, the shape of our, uh, the shape of our hidden Distribution, or, sorry, our hidden variables here are indexing into our distribution, which is a normal distribution, right? So uh, you can think of that basically like in the k-means algorithm where you take each point and you say, okay, how far is it to each of the current clusters, right? And you refine the clusters over time uh, until they sort of stop changing. So k-means is a special case of this, if you use something other than a normal distribution, which we'll do in just a moment, then you're doing sort of the you know, more advanced version of, of k-means. Limitations of this are shared with k-means. You have to pick your number of hidden variables, right? So we have to pick the number of clusters initially. And I think we had discussed, um, I'm scanning for faces because I don't know names yet. But we discussed this yesterday after class that uh, the um, that the number of clusters could be increased, and then what would happen to your log likelihood on average? Depending, you know, you have to reinitialize a few times. But what would happen to your log likelihood that you achieve once you converge? Increase. It would increase. So it's like stuffing more variables into a model. Right, it's stuffing more variables. So you think, well, okay, uh, maybe if log likelihood increases, I should just keep increasing k. That's that's great. That's fantastic. But we, we do uh, approach this this limit where you would have a single Gaussian per data point, and you, you learn nothing, right? We now we now have great difficulty generalizing. We have a lot of parameters for each of those Gaussians. Uh, we have to have enough data points to sort of compute a meaningful variance. Uh, and so it's sort of advisable that you think hard about your problem and pick k 
A, or sorry, rather H here, the number of, uh, of dimensions carefully. Uh, you're going to question what carefully means. Um, and you're right, but it's a longer it's a longer discussion, and I'm not really prepared for it. What was your question? I was going to say like is there like a like a you know like the rule of thumb kind of thing where you say like if I have ten thousand data points, I'm going to take eight equals three. I I'm going to say no. Okay. There's a there's a, there's a whole field um, called model selection, which uh, analyzes the benefits you get by increasing by increasing your your number of parameters and comparing that to the increased sort of likelihood that you get uh, and saying, okay, was that a fair enough trade-off? There's still going to be some sort of weight factor there that says, okay, in terms of units of complexity, how, does, how do units of complexity convert to units of likelihood, right? Um, so that you can say, okay, what's the equilibrium point? Why, why should I stop at six clusters and not have seven clusters? Um, yeah. And, and, and the, the the difficulty uh, the difficulty with choosing a number k can potentially be um, sort of over we can we can get over it by using something else which we'll do in t distribution so we'll, 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 we're coming up to that momentarily uh, I showed this uh, slide at the end of yesterday so I, I'll show it just again. Um, if we allow ourselves, as we, we've been doing, to have full covariance, both initially, so full covariance meaning non-zero values everywhere in the covariance matrix, um, initially, and also that the update equation is, is doing the same thing, then we might converge to a solution like this. If we say, okay, um, there's only going to be diagonal elements, so ones here, so that, and that, and that, are going to be three different numbers, they can each be changed independently of each other, uh, and all the rest are zeros. So we have a diagonal covariance. And uh, if you force that all of these elements are zero, but these three are all the same number, same uh, the same scalar number, then you'll have these ellipses that sort of look like this. They're all the same shape. And now they, let's say, don't do as good of a job as fitting the data, but maybe that is something desirable for you. Maybe that that shape of um, of normal distribution is helpful because you know something about how the test data is going to be related to your to your training data. So of course, the, the update equations will be slightly different for, for these two models than what we're using now. Um, but let's say these are the these should be simpler. I already talked about local minima. In this case, we don't have any sort of degenerate solutions in the one with the highest log likelihood, so we might say, okay, that's that's fair enough. And the faces. Now, uh, don't know if you recall the face. Do you still recall the face example we had when we fit a single Gaussian? Yes, yeah, so we should try pulling that up. Um, See, we are on slide 33, so it looked kind of like this, right? We said, oh, there you go, that's our mean face, uh, that's our covariance. Now, when we have a collection of, so we have a mixture of Gaussians, here you are seeing the mean faces. We have, what is this? Five, uh, we have 10, h equals 10. And the little number in the corner is lambda, the weight of each of those Gaussians. And what you should be seeing is uh, the chromaticity, so the, the colors that you're seeing, um, and a little bit of, of the face, and a little bit of the lighting is actually fairly distinct. So you can kind of see, um, OK, these are, let's see, these are people who are, are illuminated a little bit from the left side. And uh, let's see, hard to say anything truly. The, the, the mapping between this and sort of physical explanations is tenuous, right? Because this is just emerging automatically from fitting the Gaussian. But if we took all of the images that said in their 
H distribution and said, oh, I'd like to be associated with this mixture, they would all sort of look more similar to this example than to any of the others by definition of our EM algorithm. The result of that is when you're doing classification is that we've uh, gone up from 75% to 84% classification, uh, correct classification for, for our uh, face, not face problem. And all we did was uh, still use normal distributions, but we had more of them. We had allowed our model to have more parameters. All right. Now, we can, we can still do better. Uh, we've just done the top one, mixtures of Gaussians. We're now going to do T distributions because okay. we're worried about outliers. Sorry, just a question on the previous slide. Um, yeah. what, what, what's a good performance? Well, I mean, what the 84% of it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it depends. When you hold up your camera, mm. take a picture, and it tries to do autofocus on the faces it sees, mm. and uh, it ignores somebody, right? Then you could get angry and say that's not good enough performance, mm. right? I don't care that it's 99% on some test set. I want it to be, you know, on this scene. I want it to be uh, to get that person. So uh, I guess if a more satisfying answer to your question would be if I said, oh, the current state of the art on one of the big face databases is, you know, 90. 8%, but I don't work in this field, so I don't know what the current state of the art is. Um, I will say that for face, uh, face detection, there is a discriminative model based on boosting, which we will talk about uh, in two chapters, I think. Uh, so we will, we'll talk about it, we'll describe how it works, and, and that is actually what's in your camera. Uh, so it, uh, it has some advantages because it's a discriminative model. Um, also, maybe some disadvantages, but for the purpose of just detecting faces and being very parallelizable, so implemented easily on some hardware chip inside of the camera, uh, that one holds certain advantages over, over this one and will surely get better than 84% on this, on this data. So, don't take that as a, oh, well, in that case, I'm going to just ignore everything I've learned about mixtures of Gaussians, uh, but more uh, just sort of consider that for different problems, we still have to go back to sort of this earlier discussion of choose which type of model you're going to use, uh, and then also consider uh, your other constraints, right? So um, parallelizability of that particular algorithm I'm talking about is uh, it's the old Jones algorithm, if you want to read about it. Um, is a really big selling point. Okay, so we are going to uh, we're going to go through t distributions um, as much as possible. Uh, we're going to gloss over factor analysis <coughs> just enough so that you know that if you are facing a problem in the future, to know that ah, okay, this sounds like something where I should use factor analysis. Um, but uh, we probably won't cover it in, in detail. All right. So uh, in T distributions, um, we're going to use these kind of in place or, or actually in conjunction with mixtures of Gaussians. So if we have uh, you, you haven't seen a T distribution before, that's OK. If you have a Gaussian, um, so we have our data x, and we say, I'm going to use a normal distribution on x. Uh, probability of x, that would be the blue curve, uh, oh, sorry, that would be the red curve here, so it looks like a red dotted line. If you implemented this nice little equation down here, uh, notice it's using the gamma distribution here, this gamma function. It's also using this one extra variable that looks like a V called nu, right? So this is mu nu. Uh, <laughs> it's not my fault, okay? Uh, oop, all right. So we've, we've added nu. We still have mu and sigma squared, but now we've added nu. And if we, that appears here and here and here, it appears throughout, throughout the equation in a few places, but obviously we can implement this. It's not that hard. 
uh, when we change nu to different values, you can see that it sort of raises the shape of the normal distribution. So the normal distribution, whether you look at the sort of uh, zoomed out version or the zoomed in version near the top, right, the normal distribution, the red one, falls from, goes from the mean. If you walk in any direction, it falls very quickly, very abruptly. And then the tails go on for a long, long time um, with very, very small values. You know, already here at five, you can see it's sort of hugging the zero probability line. Hugging it, not, not touching it, obviously. If, however, you say, oh, I'll, I'll let nu equal one or three, then you should be looking at the green line or this sort of um, violet line. You can see that it doesn't drop as abruptly, right? It uh, starts off lower, but it goes on and is broader. So at five, it's still got a pretty substantial non-zero probability. But why is this useful? Why is it interesting to have uh, this thing that's just got a different shape than a normal distribution? Um, surely, if you have data points out to the side here that you want to explain, then you should just use a normal distribution, which we know and love already, uh, and just increase the variance, right? It'll just be wider and everybody's happy. Um, well, so th there is there is some difficulty with that uh, because you'll still be very susceptible to what we call outliers. So, what is an outlier it, it is sometimes this philosophical debate, but it, it need not be right uh, for a given application. It means you've gotten the data point that just doesn't belong. Maybe it's a mistake, or maybe it's a real data point, but somehow. It, it is unusual compared to all the rest. Okay, that's slightly subjective. Um, but then when someone says, oh, well, I, I have outliers in my, in my problem, you're allowed to ask them, okay, well, what's your definition of an outlier? Uh, and they have to tell you. So if we have a collection of points, this is these are the blue points, and we fit a normal distribution to those points, um, this is what we get. And uh, when you're seeing these green lines, by the way, no one's asked this, but uh, when you're seeing these green lines, this is um, this is uh, a curve being plotted where the underlying image is sort of an ISO curve, where the underlying image has is uh, is showing sort of one distribution away, one um, standard distribution away from uh, from the mean, one or two. Anyway, it's a constant number. Uh, and so, yes, you could keep drawing lots of rings like that uh, all over the, the place by just incrementing how many standard uh, distributions from the mean you are. But this is just this ISO contour to make it sort of easy to, to, to visually glance at it and say, oh yeah, okay, I, I see the shape of this Gaussian. Obviously, it's actually this underlying uh, hot cold image, right? Now. We've got those data points, we fit a normal distribution, everybody's happy. However, if along comes our outlier, uh, the normal distribution gets, gets very perturbed, right? It's, it's now changed shape drastically just because of this one point. As it should, right? It's trying to explain all of the data, and um, you know, maybe you could say, oh, well, in that case, you need to have a mixture of Gaussians. Eh, kind of tricky, now you're, you're going to be creating what, a Gaussian for, that looks like that for the data up there, and a separate one down here. We, we just talked about that problem, right? Not, not really great. So we just have our face data because of the fringing pixels. Well, you would hope that fringing happens in multiple images, and then that you are explaining not one data point, but, but many data points that, that sort of have that happening. Um, by the way, there's a, there's a, now more than one, but there was sort of an initial paper that did calculate the fringing for all cameras. Like they went through all the different models, uh, downloaded all the data off Flickr, and just calculated what is the fringing so that they could model uh, exactly that. All right, so we're going to, we're introducing this t-distribution, this funny variant on the normal distribution, because even with this outlier point, its shape looks like that. Now, the t-distribution's shape, that, that contour of this heat map, doesn't look the same with and without this point, right? It does make a difference. It is it is sort of listening. It's not just ignoring uh, things magically, recognizing things as outliers. 
But because, because it's much broader, it's basically saying, what, a point that's in x far away? Yeah, that's not super unlikely. I, I can imagine the probability of that is actually OK. And therefore, a t distribution fit to the same data with an outlier it can actually keep its mean kind of in the same place. And its variance also will be OK, depending, of course, on the, on the new, right? As we saw here, we could set new to be a very, very big number. And then it behaves more, the closer it is, you know, the bigger it is, the more it behaves like a, a normal distribution. So we can kind of tune how sensitive it is to outliers, which we couldn't do with a normal distribution because we didn't have that little, that little dial. All right. So that's the t-distribution um, sort of take, helping us cope with an outlier. Uh, the univariate student <coughs> t-distribution, um, so I've read some theories about why it's called the student t-distribution, and I think there's still basically historical debate about it. Um, but we, we just write it as stud, stud uh, distribution on the variable x. So just like a normal distribution, right, on a variable x, except now we have this extra parameter in at the end. Um, you've seen the equation for the univariate version, right, where we have just x in living in one dimension. If x lives in multiple dimensions, right, then this should look familiar. We've got the same concept here with the covariance matrix instead of the uh, instead of the variance, and nu is still involved sort of at all stages. So we have a student t distribution for the univariate case or the multivariate case. Obviously, that simplifies to, to that. Um, now this is where it gets interesting because I've introduced this student t distribution, uh, and now I'm going to show you that actually the student t distribution. Uh, I'm not going to prove it, prove it, but uh, we'll we'll walk through uh, the student t distribution can be viewed as a sum of normal distributions. We're going to. What's interesting is we've been saying, oh, we're going to have mixtures of Gaussians. We'll have a discrete number of Gaussians, right? Two or three Gaussians. What if I told you that you could have an, an infinite H? You could have H be continuous, not discrete, and you just set it, set it loose. You say, all right, uh, you're going to have a whole bunch of normal distributions, uh, as many as you like, um, and then you'll, you'll fit those to your data. It'll be as if it were a mixture of Gaussians, but uh, the mixture of them doesn't have a finite number of Gaussians, uh, you get to sort of you get to sort of adjust them. Um, they'll adjust automatically. All you have to do is pick new. So um, we're doing this kind of the other way around. So we'll say, all right, look at a t distribution as a marginalization. I.e., we had previously marginalizing three Gaussians together, right? Projecting them all onto onto one probability, and saying, oh, look at this sort of multi-peak distribution mixture of Gaussians. So um, Think of the t-distribution as a marginalization of multiple normals. Um, so we've got uh, the probability of x given some h, which will be continuous, is going to be a normal distribution. It's going to have a mean. It's going to have a covariance. The only thing is it's, it's got this scaling factor, so it's divided by the current h. So if h is this scalar, that's fine. It's got, it's got to play its role right there. And the prior on h. So we have some prior on H. We're, we're not saying all H's are equally likely. Um, the prior on H is this gamma distribution on H, which takes two parameters called alpha and beta, which in this case will we'll set them to be equal to each other. So if I, if I show you the gamma distribution, this might, this might help illustrate the point. Um, I'm going to use, so this is the gamma equation. It takes two parameters. We've seen this before, only we, we wrote gamma with x, right? So we had x on the x-axis, now we have h on the x-axis, and we have probability of h instead of probability of x. It's the same shapes. Uh, what happens when you change alpha and beta? Well, uh, the mean of the gamma distribution is alpha divided by beta, okay? Um, 
the variance is alpha divided by beta squared. You know, these are maybe mildly interesting properties of the gamma distribution. But what you should be seeing here is that it, uh, the gamma distribution lives in this space from zero to infinity, so it doesn't go negative. And it tends to have most of its mass sort of at the, at the low end, uh, sort of drop tailing off as, as h in this case goes up. So and the things to note here that we're going to have our gamma distribution as this prior on our hidden variable saying you're going to have hidden variables and I'm not sure how many of them are you, you're going to have but they're going to uh, they're going to be biased in this way towards smaller values of h okay that's my, my prior and you're going to for each h just like mixtures of Gaussians for each h you're going to be adding on a Gaussian it will be a weighted Gaussian uh, with some mean and some covariance. Right? So given an h, you can compute probability of x given h. Now, of course, we're going to marginalize out h, right? So we, we know this is, this is coming. Um, but the notes are, um, right, we have a simple way sample from the t distribution. Because we've expressed it this way, right? Uh, we've, we've expressed it as this sort of combination of gamma functions times normal distribution. We can sample on the following way. You had to sample on the assignment yesterday. You had to say, oh, uh, okay, randomly pick between h equals 1 and h equals 2. Okay, let's just pick h equals 1. And then given that h equals 1, that corresponds to one of the Gaussians, right? This was part b. Uh, given that we're, dealing, that we're using Gaussian number 1, uh, let's uh, sample data from there. Let's find, let's pick a point randomly somewhere from that normal distribution of Gaussian number one. So in the same way here, we might pick a random H, only it won't be completely random, right? Random would mean with probability, with an equal probability of picking a high H or a low H. But we're saying we're going to use this gamma function, so bias towards small numbers. Pick a random-ish H, and then given that H, compute the normal distribution, um, which we know how because we've been given the scaling factor. All right, the H has a pretty clear interpretation. It tells us which Gaussian we're dealing with. Notice that they all have the mean mu. So remember when I said this is kind of like mixtures of Gaussians, but not exactly. Do you see the difference here? Or, or better yet, do you see the difference here? What? can the mixture of Gaussians do that the T distribution cannot do? Have several means. Have several means. It can have a variety of means. So the, the mixture of Gaussians can have a mean over here and its own variance. That's fine. Uh, and the mean over here and its own variance. So the T distribution is saying, no, no, I have a bunch of Gaussians. They're all centered in the same place. You have one mean, guys. That's it. But you can have as many variances as you want uh, because we're going to have this distribution of H's and it's going to be continuous. So you lose something, you get something. Okay. Ooh, sorry, let me just check how we're doing. All right. Um, so uh, I think I just said this, right? You can think of this as an infinite mixture of normal distributions with the same mean but different variances. Okay. Visually, I hope this helps. This should, should try to you know, trying to land the plane here on, on p-distributions. Uh, we started off, we said, I've got a prior on h. Okay, it's this gamma distribution. So weighted towards low h's, that's a zero at the top there, and 10 down here. So this is our prior on h's. Um, we might have a prior on x. So we're saying, all right, our, our x's are supposed to be um, distributed somehow, and then this is what our joint probability, probability of x comma h, would look like. If we choose one of these less likely h's, so choose something down here, that would put us in this row, right? And now, if you look at the normal distribution that's happening here, and you can kind of tell that each of these stripes is a normal distribution, they're all centered around the same mean, right? If you choose this one, um, 
you're probably not going to explain a lot of data. This, but this is this is encouraging us. This is saying, well, if you're given some data and you're trying to fit a probability a, a t distribution to it, you should probably choose h's that are nice and and low up there. So when plotted, those individual stripes that you see over there, right, the red one is near the top. It's saying, right, probability of x for various values of x, right, given h equals 0 0.5. So given if you pick a really kind of a small h, then we get this spread out Gaussian. And not surprisingly, when you choose higher values of h, it gets peakier and peakier, basically narrower around this mean because there's just not much, not much probability there at all. All right. So, just like, just like mixtures of Gaussians, we can approach solutions. We can find solutions to this by applying the EM algorithm, where we're going to have expectation step, maximization step. And by now, you should be remembering that expectation is saying, okay, update my distributions on which variable? H, right? This hidden variable, and then at maximization time, we're going to update our parameters. But our parameters now are the mean, the covariance, mm -hmm. and we have this this new. Uh, so there's an E step, which works out to be this gamma distribution because we're playing this trick that this gamma distribution is over as a known alpha and a beta. Um, and so we can, we're, it is the conjugate of the normal distribution with a one something over h i uh, covariance. So that trick allows us to go from this equation to this equation. It's a very rushed <laughs> version of a derivation, so we, we won't dwell on it. The point I want you to make, I'm not trying to get you to memorize all of this, there is an update equation for theta hat, right? Theta hat is our different parameters. So of course, um, we, we figure out this equation, take the derivative of this, set it equal to zero, right? And then we get our update equation for how to update the mean, how to update the covariance. And there's not a nice way of simplifying, take the derivative, set it equal to zero, of simplifying the update equation for new t plus one. So for this, you have to do a search, okay? Uh, you can come up with all kinds of clever searches, uh, but in this case, it's only a single parameter, so maybe you can just step along the line of news and, and try them out. But the news, remember, are shaping are shaping how much of a spread your t distribution is is willing to accept, how much it will listen to or ignore outliers. Okay, um, I think that's I think that's. All I want to say about t-distributions, do we have, we have one minute for factor analyzers. So factor analyzers, when to use them, all right? This is the equation for factor analyzers. This is fine. This is a full covariance matrix. This is a diagonal covariance matrix. Why do you care? All right, because if I, let's just go straight for the, straight for the guts. I give you data. It lives in three dimensions. You think, great, I have to worry about three-dimensional data. I have to potentially consider having a full covariance matrix, three by three, with non-zeros all over the place. Wow, well, but if, that's three by three is fine, but if it's, if it's 10,000, right, by 10,000 covariance matrix, because my data x is, as we said, with uh, our pixels for faces, was 60 times 60 times three channels, right? Uh, so we have 10,000. That gets to be a very big covariance matrix, and we have to have lots and lots of training data. So back to the three by three example. If you have data that's really complicated, maybe there's no way to help you. Maybe you need a full covariance matrix. But if you have data that lives in 3D, but actually is all co-located on the same plane, then why would you worry about a full three by three covariance matrix when you could explain the data within the plane by saying, actually, all the points that I care about are some combination of phi, phi 1 and phi 2. So this is just a local coordinate frame. It's saying all the data points are some linear combination of these two unit vectors. So x can be expressed as, as living in there. So the summary for factor analyzers is it's a way 
of saying that your covariance on a Gaussian is going to be a combination of part of the matrix, some, some part of this that is full, maybe just these four elements, right, are non-zero, and the rest of it will be diagonal. So we could do that here by saying that's zero, that's zero, uh, what else did I say, and that's zero. There we go. And these are these are non-zero and that's non-zero. In other words, we have a full covariance matrix where we have to, and for all the rest to mop up the remaining degrees of freedom, we have a diagonal covariance, a, a diagonal matrix. That's factor analysis. Do this when you think your data is behaving like that. Okay? That's as much of chapter 7 as we have time for. Thank you very much. <laughs>